So we're back on Bucks Row, the second part of me going through all the trails of evidence about Charles Lechmere to show his guilt, the red flags. Now, I'm going to go back through a num a quickly a recap on some of the issues I covered in the first, uh, the first film. Uh, I always look at the comments, by the way. I don't moderate the comments, unlike lots of forums. I don't insert myself and I try and put my own personality and stamp out debate. I allow all sorts of debate on, my, on the comments, on the, on the YouTube films or on my Facebook channel for the House of Lechmere. Comment there and I'll, I'll respond to you. Anyway, I'll go through a couple of issues quickly before we carry on with the rest of these red flags. I'll start by describing the crime scene. Polly Nichols was laying, oh, there's a drop curb here. There was a big gate here into Brown Stable Yard. She was laying on the pavement here with her head in this direction, her feet slightly apart in that direction. One arm was touching the gate here. One arm was laying out into the road. Her hat was beside her. Her skirt was up to her waist initially, but was dragged down to her knees by Robert Paul. When the police found her, her skirt was down to her knees. Although it was clearly dark, her hat was visible, her bare legs were visible. So it wasn't totally pitch black. Point two, or red flag two, Lechmere and Paul only noticed each other when they were 30, 40 yards apart, which is the distance we are now. Lechmere had four opportunities, or Paul had four opportunities to see Lechmere all the way between his house on uh, Foster Street and the location here, and he didn't notice him at all until virtually the last minute. The second uh, red flag, which I'm going to uh, point out from here, is actually the fourth one, is that in his uh, initial evidence, or his national newspaper report, Paul said he saw the body, uh, Lechmere, by the body, the body was here, he saw Lechmere where the body was, where the woman was. And yet in his uh, inquest testimony, he stood in the middle of the road. And I made the point that there's no actual real difference between the middle of the road and where the body was. Uh, and that's, that was the fourth, the fourth red flag. The other point I, was going, I made under the fifth red flag was that there was dead ground up in this direction and so Lechmere would have been, or the murderer would have sensibly been more worried about what was coming from this way than in this direction, which is the direction that Robert Paul came from, which is almost certainly why he managed, Robert Paul managed to come up and disturb him because Lechmere's attention was focused in this direction. He was worried about what might come from that direction, PC Neil, on his beat, and less concerned about what would come from that way, which is why, again, he was confident of going up to Robert Paul because he knew the policeman was coming from that way and not that way. Okay, so I mentioned that Paul and Lechmere callously left the body, walked up this way, uh, both on their way to work. Uh, I said callously, well actually, Sugden said callously. There was a caretaker in here that they didn't bother knocking up. And on the side about here, there was a, a police night watchman or railway policeman looking after a great big marshalling yard that was in here. The Great, great Eastern uh, Railway had a huge marshalling yard with a policeman on the gate around here. Didn't bother knocking him up either. The callous aspect was red flag nine. I'm going to go back to that same one five, the dead ground. This shows you the dead ground. All this area here, all this area here, this was all open here. It's all got building works to the railway. But all this area was open. If PC Neil had been coming down here, Lechmere just wouldn't have known what was going on. What was going on? Because he couldn't see pretty much beyond the edge of the building here from, from, the, from the crime scene. That is why he had been very cautious about this, this particular direction. Now we'll continue with the route of Paul and Lechmere as they were on their way to work. I'll go through the I'll recap on the other, the other red flags. They're slightly out of order because I've already dealt with some of them. So you have to get your uh, thinking caps on as I go through them. The first was when Lechmere moved to Dufton Street on the 12th of June. 
The third was the time difference which destroyed his alibi. He had an eight minute time difference between him and Paul. The fifth, well, we've gone through that, was the dead ground. The sixth was the tarpaulin, the whole tarpaulin issue. I see the road's got burning, I've got to walk around a bit there. The seventh was when Lechmere refused to help prop up the body. The eighth was the evidence that showed that the culprit had been disturbed. And the tenth was that the body was freshly slain uh, as shown by the evidence of Paul thinking she was still alive, the doctor saying it happened within half an hour, and, and the blood. Now red flags aren't individually necessarily indications of guilt, they're things that you should look out for, which uh, anomalies perhaps, irregularities, things would raise an eyebrow. Individually you may come up with an alternative explanation. Some are more powerful than others, inevitably, but when you have a whole string and we've got 10 already, one after another, it starts to add up. And we're gonna get even more now. So Paul and Lechmere came up this road, which was called Baker's Road. Now it's called Valance Road. Now I've turned, after turning in from Durwood Street. Then the end of Durwood Street was called White's Row, which was a continuation of Buck's Row. And about this location here, they bumped into PC Misen, who was on knocking up duty. That is somebody who knocks on all the doors uh, of a, a, you know, a list of houses, had to knock on their doors. It was like an, an alarm call. It was an official police duty, and that was what he was doing in this area. Now, PC Miser was in H Division, which is Whitechapel. The boundary between H Division and J Division, which is Bethnal Green, is this road. So Lechmere had, and Paul had crossed from J Division, where the murder was, into H Division, and they spoke to PC Miser roughly here. We're at the junction of Old Montague Street, which is down there, and Hanbury Street, which is down there, Hanbury Street used to run all the way through, but they've blocked the end off now. At the inquest, PC Misen testified that Lechmere said to him, you are wanted in Bucks Row by a policeman. A woman is lying there. So according to PC Misen's testimony, Lechmere said to him, that Misen was wanted by a policeman who was already in situ on Bucks Road with a woman and he gave no indication of the injury or seriousness of the injury to the potential seriousness of any injury to the woman. At that stage in Misen's testimony, Lechmere was brought in from behind the scenes at the, uh, at the inquest at the, where the, where the coroner was conducting and Meissen identified him, so yeah, that's the person that I saw. Because he hadn't taken his name, hadn't taken any details from him, Lechmere had got past Meissen without giving any details at all on the basis that Meissen thought he was just a, a messenger from another officer on a non-serious, non-vital issue. Unless, of course, Meissen was being incredibly slack, misheard things, or was lying. The coroner then uh, had to remind Misen that there was someone else there. In his actual testimony, Misen didn't mention it, but the coroner had to, had to, had to remind him. He, the coroner said, there was another man in company with Cross, because he went under the name Cross, and the witness says, yes, I think he was a carman. So Misen had to be reminded that Paul was even there. It's, it's very easy to see how Paul may have not been privy to this very brief conversation between Lechmere and, and Misen. As I said, Misen had to be reminded of Paul's presence by, the, by the, uh, the coroner. Also, there is one report that says the other man, who was Paul, who went down Hanbury Street, appeared to be working with Cross. And that report implies that while the conversation was going on, Paul was sort of edging away and going off down Hanbury Street. Furthermore, Paul 
in his uh, various different statements he made was seen and shown to be quite anti-police so that's another reason why he may not have wanted to get involved in this conversation or be too close when Lechmere was talking to uh, PC Mizen. Lechmere took the stand immediately after PC Mizen at the inquest and what was his version of events? He said they saw the last witness whom they told that's him and uh, Paul they they told that a woman was lying in Bucks Row. The witness that's Lechmere added she looks to me either dead or drunk and the other man Paul remarked I think she's dead and the policeman answered all right. So there we have Lechmere categorically saying to, the, to Misen that there was a woman dead, no mention of another policeman, that she was dead, po quite possibly dead, not certainly dead, dead or drunk, whereas Paul was very certain that she was dead. Also, according to Misen, he had a conversation purely with Lechmere and had to be reminded even of um, Paul's presence. According to Lechmere, it was a joint conversation, he says they, and he involved Lech uh, Paul in saying something directly, a direct quote saying that he thought, that Paul thought the woman was dead. Now, now there's, a, there's a few things here. When they were walking all the way up here from Bucks Row to this location, it would have been very easy, potentially, for Lechmere to have said to Paul, look, we're both late for work. If we come across a policeman, it was by no means sure that they would have come across a policeman, incidentally. They could have easily got all the way up there, up Hanbury Street, with, without meeting a policeman, but they did happen to meet PC Meisen here. It would have been child's play for Lechmere to say to Paul, when we meet a policeman, I'll give him a bit of a story and get us away on time to work quickly. I know what to tell a policeman to get away. And um, given that Paul was very anti-police, he could have well acceded to that and gone along with it. Equally, it's very easy to see, given the very briefness of the conversation between Lechmere and um, Meisen, by both either of their accounts of that conversation, it's easy to see how Paul could have perhaps not really heard it properly. Come what may, there's a huge discrepancy between PC Meisen's version of the conversation, which got Lechmere away without being stopped and giving a, a uh, even his name or address or anything, or being asked to return to the scene of the crime. And Lechmere's version where he gave a sort of account to Meisen and Meisen didn't take proper action. It boils down to who do you want to believe? Lechmere, the man who I've already got 10 red flags for, and I'm going to have more. And this is another one, by the way, of course. This is a huge red flag, the 11th, a huge disagreement between PC Meisen and Lechmere. Who do you want to believe? Lechmere or PC Meisen who was a policeman who retired without a blemish on his record. No one's ever found any misdemeanors for PC Meisen. He retired when he uh, when he retired from the police he had a good rating and he was a religious man. He lived in a religious community when he was a policeman here and when he retired he became a church warden in a very religious community as well. Who do you want to believe? PC Meisen or Lechmere? My colleague Krista Holmgren, my good friend Krista Holmgren, has christened this episode the Meisen scam. It was how Lechmere got past PC Meisen without being stopped. Now, no one picked up on the dispute between, or the, the disagreement between Meisen and Lechmere. None of the papers mentioned it as it odd. Police reports didn't mention it odd. Coron didn't mention it was odd. It was just sort of glossed over and forgotten about at the inquest, for whatever reason. Now, after leaving PC Meisen, Paul and Lechmere walked off down Hanbury Street. The interesting thing is, together, the interesting thing is, Old Montague Street, which is this road over here, is actually marginally a quicker route for Lechmere to get to Pickford's at Broad Street or Eldon Street, where the entrances were. It was marginally quicker to go this way than, than this way. And this is the 12th red flag because if Lechmere had gone in this direction, he'd be going straight down towards where Martha Tabram had been murdered a few weeks earlier. And, and that, if he'd gone walking off in that way and left Paul to go this way, it could have sparked off a little thing in, in PC Meisen's head. 
afterwards, oh yeah, he went off in the way in the same direction where that other murder took place. And that's why I think he went off with Paul. Also, I think he went off with Paul so he could bend his ear, get to know more about him and where he, where he worked, what he thought, and so he could impress upon Paul his version of events for that day. So Robert Paul and Lechmere walked off down this way, down Hanbury Street, talking away together no doubt, until Robert Paul got to Cobbett's Court and he disappeared. A hundred yards before they got to Cobbett's Court, they would have passed 28 Hanbury Street. And just eight days earlier, eight days later, Annie Chapman was murdered there. Lechmere walked right past that next crime scene on that very morning. And this is the 13th red flag, because Lechmere had this uncanny habit of walking past these crime scenes on his way to work. Some people claim that there were hundreds of people on the streets at that time, any one of these hundreds of people could have done it. But all the accounts say the streets were deserted. On this particular crime, crime Lechmere himself said there was no one about, no doubt because he didn't want to be questioned further about anything. Robert Paul said there was no one about, PC Neil said there was no one about, PC Thane said there was no one about. All the evidence is these back streets were pretty deserted. So it's not the case that there's hundreds of people that could have done it. Lechmere was on the very few people on the streets at that time in the morning. Now, I'm going to leave Friday the 31st of August, the day of the murder of Polly Nichols, and move ahead to the Monday, the 3rd of September. And the second day of the inquest into the murder of Polly Nichols, which was held in the Whitechapel Working Lads Institute, which is that building over the road there, the rather impressive looking building over the road there. It was the second day of the inquest. The inquest opened on the, the Saturday, the day after the murder. Inquests always happened very quickly in, in that period. They, they didn't hang about. And up until the Monday, the 3rd, PC Neil, who I've referred to several times, the policeman who came along five minutes after Lechmere and Paul had left the body, was regarded and believed to be the first finder of the body. No one knew the whole episode that I've gone through with Paul and Lechmere, no one knew anything about it. For three and a half days, the country was in ignorance. Now, some people say the very fact that Lechmere attended the inquest shows that he was in innocent. But consider this, there was a trail of events. Once he made that fateful choice to turn and face Robert Paul, and I've gone through that uh, extensively, he turned to face Robert Paul, a whole series of probably unforeseen events followed. He then had to take Paul to the body. They, uh, he stuck with him sensibly to find out information from him and they went away from the body. Then they came across PC Misen. I've discussed how Lechmere successfully navigated that course. So after having got away, without giving his name, address, any details to PC Misen, why on earth would Lechmere turn up at the inquest? I have obliquely referred to the reason for this. The day before Lechmere's appearance at the inquest on the Monday the 3rd, on Sunday the 2nd, Lloyd's Weekly News paper which was the largest circulation newspaper in the country at the time. They, they, I think they claimed it was the largest circulation paper in the world. But the lar very large circulation newspaper carried an exclusive interview with Robert Paul. And I have been quoting from this interview, actually. In this interview, Robert Paul said, It was exactly a quarter to four when I passed up Bucks Row to my work as a carman for Covent Garden Market. It was dark and I was hurrying along when I saw a man standing where the woman was. He came a little towards me, but as I knew the dangerous character of the locality, I tried to give him a wide berth. The key section there, he saw a man where the woman was. And who was the man who he saw? Without saying his name, he, the man was Lechmere. Robert Paul had a very good look at him was with him for quite a few minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. PC Misen had a good look at him. Why do you think, after that newspaper story came out, 
Charles Lechmere felt compelled to come forward after having kept quiet for three and a half days. So the man who has callously and indifferently walked away on the Friday had suddenly become what one of my colleagues on the, in this business referred to as a good Samaritan suddenly coming forward to give his evidence after being quiet for all that time. Now actually, in a way, whether he's guilty or innocent, if he's fingered in the newspaper story, he might want to come forward because he wouldn't want the police to come knocking on his door. If he is guilty, he particularly wouldn't want the police to come knocking on his door, having put out a dragnet to find him. He would have been sensibly worried about that, or even more so if he was guilty. Now, Robert Paul himself didn't come forward. He gave a newspaper report, but he didn't come forward, and the police did that exact same thing. Once they knew the story in, in Lloyd's was genuine, they went out, they found Robert Paul, and dragged him out of the house in the middle of the night. That was the fate that Lechmere the guilty Lechmere didn't want because God knows what he'd have on him, God knows what they'd find out about him if he was caught unawares. The fact is Lechmere did not come forward for three days. He only came forward after the publication of Paul's newspaper interview and Lechmere coming forward altered the pre-existing narrative about what had happened on the morning of Polly Nichols' death. Now her body was discovered by Lechmere and Paul. Previously, she had been discovered just by PC Neil, who coincidentally came across the body while Lechmere was talking to PC Misen. So fortuitously fulfilling Lechmere's alleged claim to PC Misen that he was wanted by another policeman. The Polly Nichols case is the only one of all the Whitechapel murders where the narrative had to change, where the first finder had to change. It was, three, let's say, three and a half days later. The circumstances in which it changed was because Paul, uh, sorry, Lechmere came forward after publication of Paul's statement, which incriminated him. That's a huge red flag. That's why this is the 14th red flag. And importantly, up until the Sunday night, late on the Sunday night, the second, the day before Lechmere appeared in court, the police were still denying that anyone else but PC Neil had found the body. Oh, and the, the, the police denial on the, on the Sunday night didn't appear in the papers until the Monday morning. So Lechmere, when he turned up at the inquest, he can't have known that the police were going to deny Robert Paul's story. Now, one newspaper, it was the East London Observer, to get a bit of local flavour, mentioned the clothes that each one of the um, witnesses was wearing. And Lechmere was apparently went to work in his work clothes, went to the inquest in his work clothes, and even wore his apron, his sacking material apron, into the witness dock, dock uh, into the dock. Now why on earth did he keep his apron on? Okay, fair enough, he's maybe going to work that day and didn't anticipate how long he might be kept at the uh, inquest for. Why wear the apron into the dock? That's a perverse detail. It's as if he wanted to say, I'm a humble workman, a carman, part of the wallpaper, part of the East End street furniture, if you like. I'm very humble, very innocent, hardworking man. Here's me and my apron, waiting to get back to work. It's like he was protesting too much. And that apron, is the red flag number 15. Now we come to our 16th red flag. 16 red flag, 16th red flag. And it, his name, I've got to the 16th before I've even mentioned his name. He testified at the inquest, which was incidentally on the first floor over there with the big bay window. That was where it's held. He testified under the name Charles Allen Cross rather than Charles Allen Lechmere. He didn't even give the name Lechmere, he kept it to, him, to himself, he didn't announce it to the court. Even though in every interaction he ever had with authority, any form of authority whatsoever, he always called himself Lechmere. That goes for his own census returns. 
his electoral registration, which means his rent and his rates as well. Uh, births of his children, deaths, marriages, baptisms, his own funeral records. He, he became a businessman, had shops in business directories. He's always down as Lechmere. And yet, for this event, he decides, with this event, with very uh, uh, solemn matter, he swore in court that his name was Cross and kept Lechmere from it. Now, there was an established press procedure where witnesses in court, if they had an alias and they preferred to go to an alias, they also declared their uh, true real name. He kept it. He chose to keep it secret. He chose to keep it secret. Even if he decided, oh, I work, you know, some people claim that he might have worked at Pickford's under the name Cross, which there's no, there's no proof that he did whatsoever. And so he gave him his Cross. Why did he withhold Lechmere? Why did he say, OK, I like to go to work for Cross, but my real name's Lechmere? He kept it a complete secret. In 1888 alone, Lechmere called himself Lechmere when his, he had a daughter born earlier that year, in her birth records, in her baptism, in the school records when his kids changed school in, on June the 12th, and his electoral registration, which means also, I repeat, it means his rate, rent and rate registration for Doveton Street. All those things he registered under the name Lechmere. Goes in court here, calls himself Cross. Some people argue that maybe he called himself uh, Cross at Pickford's, where he worked. He had started work at Pickford's by his own testimony 20 years before, or just over 20 years before, in 1868, or sometime perhaps a little bit before then, which is when Broad Street Station opened, actually, the good station. So it sort of coincides. Also, his stepfather, Thomas Cross, his first stepfather was called Cross and was still alive there, but he died in 1869. Why would he still be calling himself Cross nearly 20 years later when his mother had by then married another, actually bigamous, a second bigamous marriage of his mother, uh, who was called Fosdyke. Also, his, na his name Cross did appear in the 1861 census. But he was about 12 and his, his bigamous stepfather uh, almost certainly put him down as cross and also lied about his own age because he was, he was, he inflated, his stepfather inflated his age by, by uh, uh, 10 years to make himself possible to be uh, Charles Lechmere's father because he wasn't old enough to be his father. Uh, and uh, that's the only record where, where his stepfather lied about his own age is any other record where he's known as Cross. In any case, even if, as I said, even if he's known as Cross at Pickford's, why did he withhold the Lechmere name? He obviously made a deliberate choice to do that. Now, uh, critics of the Lechmere case, oh, why, why, what possible advantage would he get by giving uh, a false name? because the police could still trace him at work or at home under the name Cross. But A, people do give false names as a reflex, uh, particularly criminals, without even thinking through the, the long-term consequences of it, they give a false name. And often, invariably, it's a name with a family connection. So Peter Sutcliffe, when he was apprehended, gave the name, instead of Sutcliffe, he gave it the name of a cousin. Uh, and I always say the story, of Dick Turpin when he was arrested, the highwayman, he gave his mother's maiden name. So it's a common thing for criminals, when apprehended, to ref reflexively give the first uh, family name they can think of. Whether it gives them any long-term advantage is, a, is a quite a separate matter. In any case, we don't know whether he was known to the local prostitutes as Lech the Lech or something like that. He may have had a uh, been notorious as let the dirty old man Lechmere. For all we know, he may have had all sorts of reasons why he didn't want the name Lechmere to be connected to this uh, crime. 
he may have wanted to keep it out of the ears of his wife, who we know was illiterate. So she couldn't read the newspapers, but she may have heard on the streets that someone called Cross was involved in it. She may have known that her stepfather, that his previous stepfather from 20 years before was known Cross. But Lechmere is a lot more of a common and unusual name than Cross. So he may have wanted to keep out of his family's ears, his involvement. So they weren't looking at him with any sort of guilty eyes. Charles Lechmere's involvement in the case was a complete mystery to his family. They had no knowledge of it whatsoever. Um, one of her, her, his great-grandsons, who's still alive, was alive when his wife was still alive. She didn't die until 1940. And there's no knowledge whatsoever in the Lechmere family, or there wasn't until quite recently, until all this came to light in the last 10 or so years, that he had been involved in the case at all. Uh, with most East End families, any involvement in the Jack Ripper case is a, is a reason to be bragging about it. In Charles Lechmere's family's case, no one knew a thing. And I'll also add that uh, Thomas Cross, the stepfather who had died in 1869, um, had in fact been a policeman in H Division. So there's a slight chance, although there's, uh, it's very unlikely there'd still be anyone around who knew him, 20 years later, there, um, there's a slight chance Lechmere thought that if confronted by the police about his use of, of the name Cross instead of Lechmere, he could have said, oh, it's my, my stepfather's a policeman and I, uh, I wanted to honour him by calling myself Cross or something like that. There was a case in 1876 where a Pickford delivery driver called Charles Cross ran over and killed a young child in Islington. It was reported in a, in a couple of newspapers. We don't know for sure whether this was the same Charles Cross. Uh, there was another coincidence. Another Charles Cross was a carman in London at the time, so it could conceivably be in him. But if it was our Charles Cross, it's strange that the only two times he calls himself Charles Cross, where he himself chooses to call himself Charles Cross are when he kills a child he was acquitted of it the father of the child thought that he was driving without due care and attention and ran over this young tot and crushed him to death under the wheels of his cart but he got off it I say he got off it the only two times when he used the name Cross that we know of is when he was in court for killing this young child and when he was found over there by Robert Paul standing right next to this freshly slain body of a woman where the signs were that the culprit had been recently disturbed. That's a strange tie-up isn't it? Well, that was a big, a big red flag, the, the 16th one there. Now we're moving on to the 17th. And as, I, as I've been going through this exercise, I've been actually found more and more red flags than I originally anticipated. Now, it was said, what advantage, has been said, what advantage would Lechmere get by giving a uh, false name if he gave his real address? Well, the whole issue of his address isn't as straightforward as all that. At the inquest, a witness was expected to give their name and address, actually usually occupation as well, to identify themselves. I believe what happened is, in the confusion and hubbub of the court, Lechmere got away without giving his address, or perhaps said it so inaudibly that no one could hear. The reason I believe this is, we know there are about 12 or 13 different um, reporters at this inquest because someone's done an analysis of all the different reports to see how many different unique versions there were. Only one of those reporters who was working for the Star, which was an evening newspaper, got his address. They didn't get a, an approximation. They got it exactly right, 22 Dufton Street. Now, when you look at, when you analyse all these different reports, there's lots of street names which are given garbled because the reporters are sitting there in court writing down what they hear. They've got unfamiliar street names, they write them down wrong. 
and proper names of witnesses. Uh, Cross is, uh, Lechmere is called George Cross quite often and all sorts of variations of his first name. Other witnesses are given completely garbled names uh, and it's because they couldn't hear properly what was going on. But the star got it exactly right, 22 Dufton Street. I think none of the other papers even got a sort of version of that. Now I think what happened is the star reporter, it was an evening newspaper, he went off in the lunch recess, went up to the usher, the court usher, saw his list of witnesses with their names and addresses, said what was that one, I didn't get that one and got it, wrote it down and got it exactly right for when he sent his copy in for the evening newspaper because no other newspaper got it at all. I think Lechmere deliberately withheld his address and got away with it in the confusion of the court. I said in the first part that oh, I showed a clip of Superintendent Andy Griffiths of Sussex Murder Squad where he said that in any modern investigation they could not seriously proceed with looking at any other suspects until Charles Lechmere was cleared by the very nature of how he was found at the crime scene with this freshly slain body by, seen by someone else before he raised the alarm with a body that showed signs uh, where the, that the killer had been disturbed. No criminal investigation could sensibly proceed without that him being cleared. But there's no evidence whatsoever that he was cleared or even investigated. Behind me, by the way, is Commercial Street. It was Commercial Street Police Station. It's the only surviving building that was a police station involved in the Ripper inquiry. How do we know, for a start, what's the salient fact, the one salient fact that tells us that Lechmere was never investigated? It is that they didn't know his name was Lechmere. It's as simple as that. In the surviving police records, of which there are several, he's called Charles Cross. In police, in memoirs by policemen, he's Charles, Cards, Charles Cross. In all the newspaper reports, he's Charles Cross. They didn't know his name was Lechmere. His name, Lechmere, was only discovered about 15 years ago by people who did genealogical research and uh, research via ancestry and so forth, looking at who lived at 22 Doveton Street and found it was, it was not Charles Cross but Charles Lechmere and then did further research from there. It was found out, you know, 15 years ago. For way, way over 100 years, 120 years, his identity remained a secret, unknown. And if the police had known his other identity, they would have put it in their reports because they put both names in his report. They would have insisted on him going to the inquest and giving both names. Some claim that because he appeared at the inquest, the police must have issued a summons and so known his home address and visited his home address to, to deliver the summons. But the fact is, because he turned up on the Monday, and up to Sunday night, they were denying that he was even part of it and that PC Neal was the first finder. It's impossible for them to have issued a summons. Physically impossible. And secondly, under the 1887 Coroner's Act, it wasn't necessary to issue a summons. It was only necessary to issue a summons to witnesses they thought were not going to attend. There was a common law obligation for anyone who thought they knew about a death to present themselves to give evidence. It was up to the coroner whether he chose to have that witness give evidence and obviously they did choose to give the evidence with, with, uh, with Lechmere. There was no obligation to send a summons whatsoever. We also know from this particular murder inquiry that the coroner told the police off, he admonished them, for failing to even interview most of the residents down Bucks Row. The, the police were failing in their task, in their duty, in this murder, to interview people properly. Through a variety of sources, the police files, the extant police files, newspaper reports, memoirs of uh, policemen involved in the case, we know the names of quite a few people who were investigated and cleared at the time. Robert Paul, for example, 
three horse slaughtermen who worked around the back of, uh, of Bucks Row. We know dozens of names of people who were investigators and cleared. Lechmere or Cross isn't one of those names. If he was such a, a high suspect, this is the irony. The uh, people who don't believe Lechmere could have done it thinks that he was so suspicious, such an obvious suspect, that the police must have cleared him. But there's no, if he was such a big suspect, why isn't he mentioned in any of these reports either? He's not mentioned anywhere, not even someone who was cleared, unlike all the other people who are mentioned and referred to as being cleared. We also know that the police investigation, by the time Lechmere came forward, just don't forget he came forward late, had already developed on a certain course. Inspector Abiline had been brought over from Scotland Yard on the Friday, the 31st, because there'd been the murder of Martha Tabram in H Division, the murder of Polly Nichols in uh, J Division, and also earlier the murder of Emma Smith in, um, in, H in H Division, and there was a belief that these three murders were linked but they crossed divisional boundaries, so Abilene was brought in on the Friday to coordinate between the divisions. And they immediately, from the Friday night, they got a suspect called Leather Apron that they thought was the most likely culprit. And it seems that the police were looking for Leather Apron and that was their focus. Lechmere was a working man. The police had a prejudice against who they thought were criminals. They thought there was a criminal class Lechmere was a hard-working family man, as far as they were concerned, not a criminal type, and so would be overlooked. He wasn't the sort of pe person the police were looking for, and they didn't understand serial, serial killers. And in the same way, as I've shown you, Ripperology itself completely overlooked uh, Lechmere. I, know, I mentioned this H Division, J Division thing, I mentioned it a couple of times. It's also important to bear in mind that PC Meisen was in uh, H Division and PC Neal was in H, uh, J Division. This is a H Division police station, incidentally. But they had no opportunity to, cr to share information between them two. They, had no, they didn't have a locker room where they were together, where they could say, oh, what happened, what happened that undoubtedly contributed to the uh, lack of information flowing between the two while the police were still denying, the police were denying on the night of the 2nd, Sunday, the 2nd of September, the very few hours before Lechmere appeared in court, they were denying that the Lechmere had anything to do with it. They were saying PC Neil was still the first finder. And they said that the policeman at either end, which is PC Thane and PC Meisen, the either end of Bucks Row, saw nobody to, uh, uh, of any significance. Meisen clearly had seen Lechmere and Paul, but he didn't think there were any significance because he thought they were messengers. And he had no opportunity, clearly, to, to work out with PC Neil what actually happened. PC Neil thought he'd signalled uh, Meisen with his lamp to call him in. Meisen thought Neil had sent messengers for him. So as far as Meisen was concerned, he was called by his fellow officer, Neil. Neil thought he called his fellow officer Meisen, but actually that's how, it, that's how it fell through the cracks because neither realized, neither had an opportunity to really discuss it with each other because they were from different divisions. This whole issue of the uh, police not uh, having any uh, investigation into Lechmere isn't a red flag, but it's an important issue to bear in mind and if you're going to do a cold case investigation you don't start on the basis of assuming the police would have investigated someone when there isn't a shred of evidence to say he was that would be absolutely insane to use that as a starting point these red flags were ignored and not even noticed by pretty much anybody involved in this whole field known as ripperology until about 12 years ago, pretty much until I started discussing this matter. We've seen the example of the Farson book, Rambolo, the Begg and Bennett book quite recently in CSI Whitechapel. I mentioned this book in the last episode, uh, The Complete Jack the Ripper by poor old dumb Donald Rambolo. And I, it's good to quote this section again, because it, it totally epitomises how poorly 
the, the, uh, the Nichols murder has been treated by Ripperology. I said this bit before. His first thought, this was, this was Lechmere prior to him meeting Robert Paul, prior to him meeting Robert Paul. His first thought that she had been raped and was still unconscious from the attack. He said something like that, but not, not at this stage. This is an out sequence. And his next, that he might have disturbed her attacker. Now, he said nothing of the sort. He didn't make any, he said he, he didn't see anyone, he had no clue. Normally, there was a great deal of noise in the street. Well, not at night there wasn't. But that hour, at that hour in the morning, it was unusually quiet. Well, it wasn't because it was a quiet street. And although he listened carefully for any strange noises, he could hear none. There was no evidence at all that he listened for any noises. That's, again, totally made up. Look how the, the Lechmere scene, where, he, where he's with Paul, discovering the body of Paul Nichols down here, is discussed or, or represented in a, a documentary called Jack the Ripper, The Definitive Story, narrated by Paul Begg, and the collaborators within it were all the main people within the field of Ripperology. And they claimed it was the most, uh, the best film ever, the best documentary ever, the most accurate documentary ever about Jack the Ripper. Watch how they show the scene. For the first time, we can present the truth about what actually happened. We reconstruct Whitechapel as it was then, revealing new clues about what really happened and who the Ripper really was. At 20 to 4 in the morning, Charles Cross was walking to work along Bucks Row. He saw something on the ground against the gates and he went yeah. to investigate hey. with another passerby, like Robert there. Paul. I think she's dead. Look, let's move her. No, I'm not touching her. Besides, I'm going to be able to work. Come on, let's at least sort our clothing out. She looks a right mess. Cross and Paul headed off, hoping to report their find to a policeman. The definitive story totally misrepresents the, the scene where Paul and Lechmere, they're actually in touching distance. Totally misrepresents it, makes Lechmere innocent straight away because they're so close to each other. Yet these voices that moan about such minor things as the missing evidence, saying that the road layout's the same when it's a bit little bit different, are strangely silent over glaring failings in, th in scenes depicted in documentaries such as The Definitive Story. Now, I may have may, may have actually missed a red flag along the way here. I've done 17. I may have missed one. If you think I have, make a comment and I'll follow it up. There's going to be another episode anyway. I've only covered here up to the inquest deliberately. Up to the inquest. There's, there's more. There's more to come. But there are more red flags here than you could put against any other suspect by a country mile. By a country mile. And if you put these red flags in front of a jury, they would not like it. They wouldn't like it one bit. It becomes, it's a forest of red flags here. A forest of red flags. You can't pick them apart. You, it can, it's such a dense amount of evidence, you cannot pick it apart. A jury wouldn't like it one little bit. I believe they would convict and the victims would finally get some sort of justice. Look out for episode three in this mini-series, The Trail of Guilt for Charles Lechmere. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share.